Uh, so I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to, uh, to speak tonight. I'm really excited about it. Um, so my name is Ben Weinshop, and I'm a data scientist with a background in materials chemistry. And um, as David mentioned, I'm going to be talking about uh, working with electron microscope data using convolutional neural networks. Um, so here's a picture of an electron microscope, this uh, massive instrument. Um, and electron microscopes, uh, unlike light microscopes, are um, so powerful they can analyze uh, nanoscale materials. So you can get much, much higher resolutions um, than you would using a traditional light microscope. Um, so what kind of uh, data can you get from an electron microscope? So this is just an example of the type of data. Um, so this is an image from an electron microscope, and this is an image of uh, coronavirus particles. Um, we're all uh, living this right now. Um, and so you can kind of get a sense from the scale bar at the bottom, 200 nanometers. Um, so these incredibly small, these particles. And uh, interestingly, coronaviruses, um, they're named for their crown-like structure, and uh, they have these uh, uh, spike protein spikes, kind of like the spikes on a on a crown, um, and you can see in the kind of the schematic here. These are the spikes, and up above is the actual um, protein itself, which is the spike. And so most of the efforts right now for therapeutics are actually targeting that that spike. Okay, so working with um, microscope image data in Python. So there's a lot of different um, libraries that you can use for working with images in Python. Um, so here I'm working with the Python image library, uh, PIL, and, uh, and just plotting an image. And this is, uh, again, an image of, from an electron microscope of, um, of coronavirus particles. And they've been recolored um, uh, for contrasts, from an electron microscope, you actually get uh, grayscale images. Um, so when you work with uh, images, it's important to recognize that images are simply multi-dimensional arrays. And if you're working with a color image, then you have three channels, a red, green, and blue. Um, so here, uh, just converting this image into a NumPy array, um, so you can see that it's 299 pixels by 299, um, and the three is the three uh, RGB channels. Um, and then you can easily just uh, do some image manipulation. Here we're reducing the pixel size down to uh, 28 by 28 and, uh, and normalizing it. So I've been working on a... Um, an app called Electron Microscope Assistance. And um, this is a, a Flask-based uh, web app. And it's, it's basically a nanomaterial image classifier. And the idea behind this app, um, this is a simulation here of the app, um, is that after you've taken your microscope image, you can just simply drag it into the app and the app will um, classify the object that you're looking at. And the motivation here is that these electron microscopes are very costly to operate, hundreds of dollars per hour. And um, so this will help to kind of speed up the analysis side of, of that. So to build the, uh, the image classifier, I used a data set of uh, electron microscope images from the Italian Institute of Materials, um, about 20,000 images or so. And uh, they're broken up into 10 different labels that I'm gonna classify the objects uh, by. And so these are just representative images of what the different uh, classification labels are. Um, so things like biological as uh, one category, uh, fibrous materials, nanowires, uh, nanoparticles, sponge-like materials. This is what your kitchen sink sponge would look like under an electron microscope with all these pores. Um, so this kind of gives a sense of what the images were like that were used to train the model. So uh, convolutional neural networks um, are a type of artificial neural network. And 
they are particularly good for image image classification. That is kind of one of the, their main features. And um, so convolutional neural networks or CNNs kind of have two pieces to the architecture. There's the feature learning part, and then there's the classification part. And um, in the feature learning uh, part, really the heavy lifting um, is in this convolutional transformation. So if you think about an image as just a multi-dimensional array, um, in the convolution, you're passing a filter, and this is meant to be kind of a simulation of what's happening. So you're passing a filter over your image to determine and find features within your image. And so maybe you're trying to identify like an edge of a feature or like a diagonal of, of, your, um, of your feature. And uh, so that's the, the convolution step. So what this looks like uh, in Python, this is uh, just some sample code for a two layer uh, CNN. And this is using the Keras TensorFlow API. Um, so first, uh, kind of setting up some of your parameters. So this is a 28 by 28 pixel image that's in grayscale. Um, I'm classifying into 10, 10 different categories. Uh, these are some of the parameters for um, the transformations. And uh, so, like I said before, so there's two kind of main areas. There's the feature learning and there's the classification. And so in this simple model, I'm just doing two uh, convolutional layers. So one and two here. Um, so this is just kind of to get a, a general sense of the um, of how you would set up and build your, um, your CNN. So um, for a, a model like this that only has two convolutional layers, um, the accuracy is actually quite low. So this is accuracy versus kind of number of epochs or iterations or training cycles. And um, the, the accuracy, accuracy is pretty low, so less than 50% uh, for, the, for the validation set. Um, and so in order to kind of overcome some of these types of barriers and accuracy, there's some other kind of tricks that you can play. Um, so one of them is um, called feature uh, or transfer learning, where you can take a pre-trained model um, and then build your model on top of that. So one example of that is using the exception model, and this is kind of showing the accuracy here um, when you use transfer learning. Um, and uh, you can get pretty, pretty reasonable accuracies um, in uh, using this approach. So um, I, here's my contact information. Uh, if anyone has uh, questions later on down the line in the future and you're working with uh, image data or microscope image data in Python, um, definitely feel free to reach out and, and contact me. And uh, yeah, thanks everyone for, for your attention. Thanks, Ben, that was, that was great. Uh, do you want to take questions now, or do you want to you want to hold them till later, or you want to? Um, if yeah, if folks have a, a question, I'm happy to. Just depending on time, um, I can I can field a question if we have time. We should be Some okay. Cool images. I wish I had a, an SEM in my basement. <laughs> yeah, no, they're they're pretty they're pretty costly. Um, to get one of these instruments, um, you know, usually you know if you're looking for a state-of-the-art um, transmission electron microscope, you know, starting at a million dollars. And uh, hourly rates for those are several hundred dollars per hour to operate. Where's your lab? Um, so the, uh, the data that I had collected was at the University of Oregon uh, previously at um, uh, the Department of Chemistry there. And uh, are you this, important uh, the data set that, um, that I trained on was um, from the Italian Institute of Materials. Um, mm -hmm. This 
uh, these images, over you know, 21,000 or so, um, were collected by other scientists and made open source. Um, and, uh, and they collected all of this on a, a scanning electron, electron microscope. I'm, I'm, uh, uh, Kevin Kaufman at UCSD has asked me to help him with a, a paper doing a similar stuff, but for um, X-ray diffraction Im images. So um, sure. and, and calculating space groups, not the actual substance, but just getting the space group out of it. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of really interesting things you can do with X-ray diffraction because, you know, at the end of the day, when you get your X-ray diffraction pattern, you're trying to predict the, you're trying to figure out the structure, you know, the, the, the arrangement of atoms in space. <laughs> and so if you can, um, you know, train your X-ray diffraction uh, uh, experimental data, um, you know, if you have enough data, then you can really um, get a much better kind of search match when you have this brand new X-ray diffraction pattern that you've collected. And um, you can get a much better match. And X-ray diffraction data is particularly complicated because oftentimes you're dealing with, you know, like a, a mixture or multiple components and so, you know, you might have like 10 different phases in your substance and you're trying to figure out, you know, well, what are the 10 different components? And they all have their own unique X-ray diffraction pattern. And so neural networks can, are particularly powerful for kind of parsing out those different components. Um, so that would be, uh, that's an interesting project that you're working on as well. Did you, did you do transfer learning or did you use a, a fresh uh, clean neural network? So I started off with uh, just a, um, a plain uh, CNN with two layers and the actually actually was pretty poor. Um, so kind of the next step was to then use the exception model, which is a pre, it was just a pre-trained model um, that's already looked at over a million other images and um, and then I built my model on top of the, the exception model. And so in order to kind of get this to actually perform like it's doing right here with this kind of accuracy, I needed to use that uh, transfer learning with the exception model. That's exactly what we did with, uh, with ResNet. You have two questions in the chat. Uh, user HussN asks, how many pre-trained models did you try? That's a really good question. Um, so I had done a lot of kind of um, background research on, um, you know, what are were some of the best transfer learning models out there, and um, re the ResNet was was just mentioned. So that, I know that's a really good uh, transfer learning model. Um, I went directly to the exception model um, because I I knew that it had it was pretty state of the art. And um, so that was um, the main one that I kind of played with after my, my kind of initial simple CNN. That's a good question though. The other question is, this comes from Dan King. Why is the electron microscope so big? What's in there? <laughs> <laughs> Another really good question. So uh, the reason why they're so tall is because um, so you're generating your image from electrons rather than light and so you have to accelerate electrons to a very high velocity in order to get a wavelength that is um, small enough to actually give you the resolution that you need so in order to get an electron to accelerate fast enough you need a, a long runway. And so that's why there's the, some, some of the best electron microscopes are like two stories high. You have to like cut out the ceiling in order to have like enough runway space for the electrons to, to tunnel through. Yeah, so that's another really good question. Uh, we have one more question in the chat. 
I, I might call it after that one. Uh, maybe we have time maybe for one more after that. But so uh, Morgan asks, are you using Python to improve the image classifier algorithm? That's a good, really good question. Um, so I haven't played around too much uh, on that front. Um, the accuracy right now of the, the model is, it's in the 90% range. Um, some of the things that I'm looking at, um, the other gentleman had mentioned X-ray diffraction. Um, so you get a lot of information um, from an electron microscope um, other than just you know, the, you know, the shape of it. You get structural information as well. So I'm looking at encoding other pieces of information um, along with the actual like physical image to get kind of more, um, more information um, for the classification. So not just the, you know, the shape of it, but actual chemical composition um, as well to kind of aid in the classification. I think that will make it even more effective. Cool. Any other questions before we, before we move on? Well, well, thanks, Ben. That was, that was awesome. I learned some things. Okay.